God is a man. Is a man brave? Is a man a hero? Is a man is a man a protector? Is a man vulnerable? Is a man disposable? Is a man broken? Is a man trying? We see the good in men. Father, as we open the Word of God this morning and we talk about what the Bible says about masculinity, would you prepare our hearts to receive what it is your Spirit is saying to each and every one of us this morning? We live in a confusing world, but yet we have this anchor, the truth of your Word. And we need to know it better. And so expand our understanding of your truth this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Get your Bibles out if you would. We're going to talk about this morning, this, trying to answer this question, what the Bible says about technology not working. And the Bible says that it should work, but it's not working. It's on, there we go. Is that you, David, or is that me? Did I do it? Okay, good. It's working now. Good. What is a man? Well, the last two years have seen a dramatic culture shift that no one saw coming. We were all taken by surprise as our eyes were opened to a, a, a cultural Marxist worldview that had gone largely unnoticed and unchecked for years. A worldwide pandemic, COVID-19, a social justice movement that spawned race riots, and a political upheaval that has sharply divided this country. The America we once knew, folks, is gone. And the result is what? People feel lost. People feel lost. This sense of loss is perhaps most clearly illustrated uh, by the current gender confusion phenomena. Gender dysphoria, uh, a mental illness, by the way, the condition of feeling one's emotional and psychological identity to be at odds with one's birth sex, is tearing families apart, in fracturing society as it continues its momentum fueled by a radical LGBTQIA plus agenda. What was once universally understood, two genders, is now up for debate. And you can sure be sure, you can surely bet the farm that once the, that foundational building block of gender is in question, a society will eventually fall apart. Because that's a building block of society. So this morning I want to take a biblical look at the first gender created by God. Man. And I hope to, to 
clear up the lies people believe about masculinity with the truth of God's word. And interestingly enough, this is something that society is asking for in our current gender-confused community. According to Mickey Fear, Fayer of Psychology Today, he wrote this, and this was like two years ago. About 90% of people believe that society would benefit from a conversation about what modern masculinity is. In 2020, the Mantra Shift Institute conducted research in the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Austria, and Jordan, in which 200 men were interviewed of various age groups and backgrounds. And the reason for this survey, this is what they wrote, as long-standing structures and stereotypes are being reevaluated, masculinity and manhood are in crisis. The old masculine stereotypes of being aggressive, privileged, and tough while also being hypersexual and unemotional, are being dismantled. At the same time, we also are seeing these old stereotypes being embraced and re-embraced around the world by many extremist movements. Masculinity, what it means to be a man, is clearly being reconsidered. Now, if men are questioning manhood then what are they passing on to their sons about manhood, right? Well, we're going to look at three other videos this morning. There'll be a lot of videos in this sermon. I don't know when to do this, but I'm going to start on a, on a lighter note. The comedian Kevin James tells a funny story about vomiting or throwing up in amusement park rides and modeling manhood to his son. David, can you put that video up? This is in his uh, comedy series, Kevin James, Never Don't Give Up, and where he throws up riding the pirate ship. You ever know what the pirate ship is? That ride? <laughs> People are like, uh. So, some tolerant. A tummy ache. That's what it was back then. I didn't know anybody when I was growing up that had, was lactose intolerant, but it is a real, real thing, so... So now I got your attention, I got you laughing. We're going to t talk more seriously about biblical masculinity. And I want to dive right in. There's a definition that I want you to, if you want to write this down, you can. But this definition came from John Piper in a book called Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. It's in the first chapter of the book, and it defines masculinity in this way. At the heart of mature masculinity is a sense of benevolent responsibility to lead, provide for, and protect women in ways appropriate to man's differing relationships. Now he goes on to, to clarify what mature masculinity is. He says, a man might say, I'm a man, and I do not feel this sense of responsibility that you say makes me masculine, i.e. a sense of responsibility towards women. He may feel strong and sexually competent and forceful, but we would say to him that if he does not feel this sense of of benevolent responsibility. What does benevolent mean, by the way? You want the good for somebody, benevolent, okay? The sense of benevolent responsibility towards women to lead, provide, and protect, his masculinity is immature, incomplete, and perhaps even distorted. This is a biblical definition of mature masculinity. You're seeking the good of women to lead, provide for, and to protect. So let's take a look at kind of where he got this from. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Get your Bible, your phone, your tablet, whatever you have. If you have a Bible, there should be some in the pews in front of you. This is where biblical masculinity started. And it begins right here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. God created man first. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Then, stay in chapter 2, look at verse 18. Then he creates who? Eve. 
Then the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Then jumping down to verses 21 and 22. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib, which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Okay, so obviously man was created first, then woman. Now, what does that have to do with masculinity? It, it, a lot. Because Paul says this regarding man, men and women based on the created order. See this in 1 Corinthians 11.3? But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. Okay? Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of woman. And God is the head of of Christ. So what we see here in the created order, and what Paul is saying here in the New Testament, referring back to the Old Testament, is that there is a, a chain of command, if you want to call it that, a, a structure based upon a created order. Now this male, the man is the head of the woman. The woman completes the man as his helper. And the male-female relationship is to be a picture of beautiful complementarity as both mutually submit to one another. Now, understanding this, turn to Genesis chapter 3. This is our next set of verses, starting in verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the tree, trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that, she, that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Now what does this tell us about masculinity? Well, man, in this story Adam, but in all men, are uniquely called to account for his leadership, provision, and protection in relation to women. This is illustrated in Genesis 3, 9, when God says to Adam first, where are you? Who had sinned first? Eve sinned first, but God does not seek her out first. Adam must give the first account to God for the moral life of the family and of the marriage relationship. A.K.A. husbands, if your wife isn't happy, part of it is on you. You're going to give an account. Okay? I don't like it, but that's the rule. So from the very beginning, men, as we can see, are to have this sense of benevolent responsibility to lead women. But not only to lead, but also provide. In this instant, it would have been Adam's responsibility to provide the spiritual instruction to Eve regarding the laws of God. Because God told Adam, not Eve, to not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In Genesis 2, 16 and 17, he said to the man, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in that day that you eat it you will surely die. Then, verse 18, what happens? We just read it. Eve was created. Okay? So in this regard, Adam did instruct Eve, right, about God's commands. 
for she knew she was forbidden to eat from this particular tree. But Adam failed to do the last thing, which was protect Eve. Guys, notice, he was with her while she was being tempted by the devil. Passively standing by, just watching it happen, and then eventually following her leadership into sin by eating the forbidden fruit. Look at verse 6 of Genesis chapter 3. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and look at that, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. While Adam provided for his wife the spiritual instruction, he failed to benevolently lead and to protect her. And because Adam failed to lead, God forces him to lead as he contends with his wife with leadership for the relationship. Look at Genesis 3.16. And the curse given to the woman, what does God say? Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. See, as Eve stepped out of her role, and what is her role? Genesis 3, she's simply what? A helper. She stepped out of her role as a helper to Adam and then led the relationship into sin. God gives her over to that desire to rule her husband, to be the leader. And as she competes with the man for headship or for leadership, what does it say? He will rule over you. So every male holds the trump card of male domination as he will rule over her. And this rule by men over women hasn't always manifested itself in godly headship, but rather oftentimes ungodly male domination. You with me so far? The number one complaint I get from wives about their husbands is that they are passive and they're failing to take leadership in the home. That goes back to masculinity, for who you are as a man. Mature masculinity has that benevolent responsibility towards women to lead, to provide for, and to protect. Now Paul reaffirms the roles of men and women in relationships and more clearly defines biblical masculinity in the New Testament. Now turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 5, 22 through 31. I'll give you a few minutes to get there, or a few moments to get there, rather. Ephesians 5, 22 through 31. Can you go to the middle of your Bible and make a right, or go to the very end and go to the left, and you'll get there. Ephesians 5, 22 through 31. I would put these verses up there, but they're such large passages that it would just take up too much space. Starting in verse 22. Wives, be subject to your husbands, to your own husbands as the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives and their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members 
of his body. And so we get more of a clarification now of masculinity and femininity. The wife is to submit to the husband. Why? Because that was God's design from the beginning. She is his helper. He was created first, then Eve. He was incomplete. God created woman to help man. The husband is the head or the leader, and the wife is the helper. The husband's leadership, his provision, his protection is revealed, now listen to this, men, as he submits to his wife through his love for her. This love is sacrificial, purifying, caring, and unbreakable. Two weeks ago, we went through that. Men, you do not lead with an authoritarian leadership style. Because this form of love reveals the type of leadership the husband is to model. It's not authoritarianism. It's not condescending. It's servant leadership as modeled by our Lord Jesus Christ. You serve your wife. My wife has heard me say this over and over again, that I don't like being the, the husband or, or, or the male in the relationship because I never get a break from leading. I find that burdensome, to be honest with you. If I'm going to take this seriously, that means that I'm always leading. So I'm leading this family. I go home. I've got to lead. It gets tired, tired. What does that mean, for example? It means that I don't go home and sit down and let my wife serve me the rest of the day. I help with the dishes. I make meals. I do cleaning as well. When I'm gone, that's her role. But it's, it, you're, you're serving. It's, 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 it's draining. And I know it's not easy to follow me, but that's the role of the woman. See, this leadership does not demand to be served, but uses its strength to serve and sacrifice for the good of the woman. The need for biblical male leadership in the home and in society, I would argue as well, is so urgent that psychologist James Dobson calls it America's greatest need. He wrote this in 1980, folks, and it is even more truer today. A Christian man is obligated to lead his family to the best of his ability. If his family has purchased too many items on credit, then the financial crunch is ultimately his fault. If the family never le- reads the Bible or seldom goes to church on Sunday, God holds the man to blame. The children are disrespectful and disobedient. The primary responsibility lies with the father, not his wife. In my view, America's greatest need is for husbands to begin guiding their families rather than pouring every physical and emotional resource into the mere acquisition of money. God's design for a blessed society is a patriarchal structure where male headship is wed to female Submission. A patriarchal society, that is under attack. Wed to male headship, wed to female submission. And it's not surprising where Satan first attacked, this is where Satan first attacked God's creation. Let's talk about masculinity being under attack. Now we just read the story of the fall of man in Genesis 3, 1 through 9. Well, what did Satan do there? We ignored God's design for male-female relationships, Right? The devil, in one strategic act of treachery, he undermined not only the first family, but God's entire system of earthly rule. Because if you think about it, God is the head of man, man is the head of woman, and mankind together, male and female, preside over the animal kingdom. Essentially, the pattern was God, man, woman, animals. Okay? God, man, woman, animals. Satan literally turned that entire system on its head. An animal, the serpent, came to the woman, Eve, counseled her to act independently of her husband, Adam, and to disobey the creator, who is God. So ultimately, the fall of man was a case of sex role reversal. God's patriarchal structure was targeted, and a weak, passive masculinity failed to protect the woman. This is a pattern you find throughout Scripture. 
you have a weak, passive male king in Ahab and a strong, dominant female queen in Jezebel. Remember that story? This pathetic story is found in 1 Kings 21. In short, King Ahab wants to buy land that sits next to him, his property, but the owner, Naboth, refuses. Even though he is a powerful king, Ahab pouts. He pouts. So his wife, the wicked queen Jezebel, sees the king pouting and then plots to kill Naboth. And through the testimony of false witnesses, Naboth is stoned to death. And then Ahab is able to buy the land. Now verse 25 of 1 Kings 21 paints a clear picture of passive male submission led to dominant female leadership. Look at this. Surely there was no one like Ahab who had sold himself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Well, why? Because Jezebel, his wife, incited him. Who controlled who? She controlled him. Weak, male submission, strong, female leadership. That is not God's design. In Jeremiah, we find passive husbands led by their wives into the worship of false idols. Look at this verse. And, no, no this is women speaking. And said to the, said the women, when we were burning sacrifices to the queen of heaven and were pouring out drink offerings to her, was it without our husbands that we made for her sacrificial cakes in her image and poured out drink offerings to her? So they're leading the way into worship, and where are the husbands? They're there with them, letting it all happen, following. Now, doesn't this story in Jeremiah 44 remind you of Adam? Passively standing by, in agreement with Eve, eating the forbidden fruit. The attacks on masculinity, well, they continue in our time, easily. First, you have the feminist movement. Biblical masculinity and femininity. They are rooted in the idea that men and women are equal. Women are equal to men in value, 1 Peter 3, 7, in image, Genesis 1, 27, and in moral responsibility, that's Romans 14, 10 through 12, with different God-given roles while living in a patriarchal society. That's God's design. The foundation of the feminist movement, since its inception, has been grounded in the unrest of inequality between men and women. And over time, the competition for leadership in male-female relationships resulted in what? This was ultimately going to happen because of the curse in Genesis 3.16. What was going to happen? Ungodly domination of women. That's what happened ungodly domination of women by men and led to a patriarchal society that viewed women as inferior to men. That was never the case from the very beginning. You have what you call a pre-feminism error. Women were meant to be proper, delicate, and emotional nurturers of the household. They were raised in a manner in which gaining a husband to take care of them and raising a family was their ultimate priority. You remember those times, anybody? During the 1960s, the women's liberation movement, that that idea was challenged, and eventually it became discouraged. And by the 20th century, women had the mindset of wanting to have it all. They wanted a professional career, as well as be a wife and a mother. And this, of course, is not God's design for the family. Now, there's a Proverbs 31 woman that is working outside the home, but it's wed to female or to male headship as the husband is the primary provider. Now, I'm not going to go into any more detail about this, but we look at it a little bit more next week. But it's safe to say that the next two movements, the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter, are offshoots of the feminist movement. You have the Me Too movement, a social movement against sexual abuse and sexual harassment where people publicize allegations of sex crimes. 
And the original purpose of Me Too movement, as I researched this, was interesting. I don't know if you knew this or not. When you think of the Me Too movement, who do you think of? Anybody? Lisa Mayano, Rose McGowan. But it started way before that, 2006. A Tarana Burke started this movement to empower women through empathy, especially young and vulnerable women. In October 2017, Alyssa Mayano encouraged the, using the phrase as a hashtag to help reveal the extent of problems with sexual harassment and assault. And while this movement shone a light on a taboo subject and led to the downfall of such men, can you name any of these men that the Me Too movement took down? And partially, rightfully so. Harvey Weinstein, him, Andrew and Chris Cuomo, Kevin Spacey, Matt Lauer. For unfortunately, this movement was also used as a political weapon, targeting innocent men, such as Supreme Court Justice who, Brett Kavanaugh. There are also false allegations of sexual abuse directed toward famed lawyer Alan Dershowitz. Do you remember this? He wrote a book about his experience with the Me Too movement called Guilt by Accusation, The Challenge of Proving Innocence in the Age of Me Too. But it also happened to an average Joe named Mike Tunnison. You've probably never heard of him. He was a successful freelance writer for the Washington Post author of a book published by HarperCollins and was an editor of a successful website. Today, he works on the janitorial staff at a Dave & Buster's. How did he get there? Well, in October 2017, at the height of the Me Too movement, he was, his name was added to a Google document that collected allegations of misconduct from anonymous, unvetted sources. Anonymous, unvetted sources. And because his name was on that document, guess what? His career was over. And as a result of this, corporations jumped on the Me Too movement when this was going on. Remember this? They are all about it. And they began attacking masculinity and the phrase toxic masculinity was born. The shaving company Gillette put out a controversial ad that received praise and criticism David, can you put that video up? It's like a, a few minutes. This is the ad that Gillette put out where the phrase toxic masculinity uh, originated from. Bullying. The Me Too the movement against toxic sexual harassment. masculinity. Is this the best a man can get? Is it? We can't hide from it. Sexual harassment is taking over. It's been going on far too long. We can't laugh it off. Who's the daddy? <laughs> what I actually think she's trying to say. Making the same old excuses. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. But something finally changed. Allegations regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment. Once, but she says it's a problem. And there will be no going back. Because we, we believe in the best in men. Men need to hold other men accountable. Smile, sweetie. Come on. To say the right thing. To act the right way. Am I cool? Am I cool? Some already are. In ways big. Yo, men. And small. I am strong. I am strong. But some is not enough. So how we treat each other, okay? Okay. Because the boys watching today will be the men of tomorrow. Did you ever see that video, by the way? Yeah. It was put out there and it was controversial. Because there were men's careers and lives, and I just read one of many that were destroyed falsely 
by the Me Too movement. Granted, there are men that deserve the accountability for sure. The bigger point I'm trying to make is that masculinity is under attack. The backlash from this video included calls for boycott of the Procter & Gamble company, complaints that the commercial masculates men, and articles were written that condemned it as part of a pathetic global assault on masculinity. Masculinity is under attack in the Black Lives Matter movement. Because it was take, before it was taken off their website, here are two of the beliefs of Black Lives Matter. And remember this. We build a space that affirms black women and is free from sexism, misogyny, and environments in which men are centered. Now, what is God's design for society? Is it a matriarchal or patriarchal society? Patriarchal. This isn't a direct attack on that. Therefore, they are blatant. We dismantle the patriarchal practice that requires mothers to work double shifts. They're bl blaming men that bl women have to work double shifts so that they can mother in private even as they participate in public justice work. So they want to pull down, this movement wants to pull down the leadership of men. Now to the defense of these movements, and particularly the Black Lives Matter movement, the black community, as you know, specifically black fathers, has been destroyed by the welfare system. The government has incentivized women to marry the government, to marry welfare. And the men know this, and so they get women pregnant and they leave. That's not masculinity at all. Welfare has replaced the father in the home, in, in not just black communities, but also it's now Hispanic, it's white, in, in Asian communities. Because welfare has replaced the father in the home, men abandon the responsibility of fatherhood leaving the mother to raise a child on her own. Now, that's not mature masculinity at all, okay? But as a whole, masculinity is being attacked. I think part of the reason why masculinity is being attacked is because there's a missing ingredient. There is no rite of passage for men in American society. I discovered this article last week, and I'd like to read just a portion of it to you this morning. It's about these men right here. Yes, these are men. And a rite of passage was once upon a time given in any man's life. This is an article, two articles I'm going to read to you. Um, this one is by Peter Ross, written in 2015. This, I think, will sound familiar to you. A rite of passage was once upon a time a given in any man's life. At some point in his teenage years, he would take, he'd be taken from the tribe by elders to somewhere remote. We would go through the initiation that would transform him mentally, emotionally, and spiritually into a man. He would go through discomfort, hunger, lack of sleep, even pain before the transformation could be complete. He would then come back to the world a different person, capable of making adult decisions and functioning as such within the tribe. And we'll get to this in a minute. But the fact of the matter was for Peter Ross, so the fact of the matter was, however, that I was a 26 year old boy and I was in serious need of some discipline and direction in my life. I had a good upbringing with excellent parents and I never got in trouble with the law or anything like that, but I was lost. I had never really bothered to study at school because I didn't need to, which meant that my first shot at university turned out to be a disaster. So I took a year off, did some traveling, and then managed to get a liberal arts degree, which was about as useful as a heater in Florida. This hardly solved the problem because after a short trip to Japan, I was largely in the same boat with no idea of what I wanted to do, living with my parents, in no direction. I believe this story is a story of untold men in American society. But what if they had men in their lives that guided them into manhood? What if they were young men in this tribe, the Masa tribe? The Masa tribe of Kenya and Tanzania 
have a series of rites of passages that carry boys into manhood. And every 10 to 15 years, a new warrior class will be initiated into the tribe. Boys between the ages of 10 and 20 that you see behind me, they're brought together from all across the country. Dozens of houses are built that will serve as a place of initiation. And the night before the ceremony, the boys sleep outside in the forest. At dawn, they return to the little makeshift homestead for a day of singing and dancing. They drink a mixture of milk, cow's blood, and alcohol, and eat piles and piles of meat. And after the festivities, boys who are of age, 12 to 16, are ready to be circumcised. So basically, they get them drunk and fed, and then they circumcise them. The emeritaire is the most important ceremony in the life of a Massey boy. Once circumcised, the tribe will consider him a man, a warrior, and a protector of his village. As a young man makes his way to where the elders will circumcise him, friends and family members will taunt the boy by saying things like, if you flinch, we will disown you. The Massey tribe value bravery in their warriors, and circumcision is the boy's first way to prove his courage, even in the face of severe pain. And it takes about three months for the circumcision to heal. And during that time, the young men wear black clothing, as you see behind me, and live in huts built by the women of the village. The Messiah boy is now a warrior. But for the next 10 years, the young men live together in a manada, a warrior's camp. There they learn fighting, oratory, and animal husbandry. After 10 years, the young men take part in the Unodo ceremony that marks their transition from warrior to senior warrior. And after Messiah have passed through the Unodo, he can marry. And the ceremony is basically several days of festivals, which ends with the initiate's mother shaving his hair. And he is now considered a man and enters back into the tribe. If there's a rite of passage for American males, it's you turn 18 and you're able to drink and you get drunk, right? Knowing this, back in the mid, mid to late 90s, we held a men's retreat at a home in Hudson, my parents' home in Hudson, Ohio, and we brought the students from Bowling Green to the home in Hudson, and there was like 30 or 40 men, and we had four staff members, and we decided to do one night a rite of passage night. And the four of us stood in four corners, and we had names given to us, and we had all the guys in the center of the room, and we called them out by name, and then affirmed them as men. And as we were doing this, there was this, it was as if the Holy Spirit fell, and it was extremely serious. People, these young men were, were tearing up as they were being called out to become men and recognized as a man. Needless to say, if there was biblical masculinity, where there was that benevolent responsibility that all men felt to lead, provide, and protect women, I'd like to think that there would be no such thing as a Me Too movement or a Black Lives Matter movement. But you know that God's design for men, what I've just gone through this morning, that is not easy. Is it? It is not. But I believe, and society is telling us, this is what we need. And so it's a very simple application point. Women, you get the time off this week, but act like men. Okay? What does that mean? 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Maybe you men should memorize it. Be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. And that's all I got to say about that. Amen? Amen? Do you stand with me? We'll close with the last song. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for your words to us this morning. May men act like the men you've called us to be. You've empowered and enabled us to be. And all God's people said, Amen.